in our lessons in discipleship, we come to integrity. And that's an important word for Christ's followers. It was something that the Pharisees, when they came to Jesus, spoke about and said that Jesus was a man of integrity. Let's read about it. You find it in Mark chapter 12, from verse 13. We'll read various sections of this chapter together. But in verse 13 we read, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He, sa he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. The next section starts at verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no one but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. But finally, from verse 38. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honour at banquets. They devour women, widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Learning integrity. Following Jesus does something to our characters. We're becoming like him. He taught through what he was, as well as through what he said. The disciples observed and they learnt. And one thing in these verses is very clear indeed, and that's the first heading on your outline. Integrity is in short supply. When these men came to Jesus, we've got it in verse 14, they said to him, we know you are a man of integrity. The word integrity means genuine, honest, sincere. 
And of course it was right here that the Pharisees and the Herodians themselves failed desperately. They'd come to catch Jesus in his words. There's no integrity there. And it would be good to take time when you're reading this passage on your own to think about the words in verses 38 to verse 40 which describe those teachers of the law, those Pharisees, for just the people that they really were. Certainly not men of integrity. And the Herodians were just the same. They were lined up with Herod, whom Jesus referred to as that fox. Fox was a metaphor for someone who was crafty, cunning, contemptible and crooked. There was no integrity in Herod, nor in those that lined up with him. And there's very little integrity around today. We find in politics, in commerce, again and again, signs of a lack of integrity. We're confronted with the common practice of cooking expenses, or falsifying income tax returns, or bribery, either on a small or a large scale. Integrity is conspicuous by its absence in so many situations. But if integrity is in short supply, we're reminded on our same outline that integrity holds to the truth. And that's what marked Jesus out. It was true of him. The Pharisees' compliment was absolutely true. You are a man of integrity. And Jesus spoke the truth. Again and again, one of the common phrases of Jesus was, I tell you the truth. We've already found it in today's reading. In verse 43, I tell you the truth. This widow put in more. It was a way in which Jesus presented God's word to people. He said of himself in John 14, 16, I am the way and the truth and the life. As his integrity shone out in front of Pilate when he was hauled up on trial. Jesus said to him, Pilate said to Jesus, You are a king then? And Jesus replied, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Pilate's reply was, What is truth? With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. And then he proceeded to hand him over to be crucified. A man of integrity met a man who didn't know what integrity was about. So the life of Jesus backed up what he, what he said. In verse 14, the Pharisees show that they'd observed it you pay no attention to who people are. You're straight through and through. And so when he comes before Herod, that fox, Jesus knows how to treat him. We read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had wanted to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. He knew how to deal with foxes. He was a man who was straight. But he, on the contrary, he had plenty of time for a man named Zacchaeus, who left his duplicity and came to Christ honestly and was forgiven. Being kind in word and action, being true in word and action, is of prime importance. Our kindness, our honesty, will be transparently evident in the things that we say and do. For example, Paul writing to the Ephesians in chapter 4 verse 15 says, Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. It's in loving, in kindness, that the truth is to be revealed among those where we live and work. Speaking the truth in love 
we're to grow up into him. And later on in that same chapter, verse 25, Paul writes, Each of you must put on off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. It's this emphasis on integrity that comes through again and again. I had an accountant friend in Pakistan who was a Christian, wanted to serve Christ in a firm as an accountant. And it was his integrity that came through at the end of the financial year. He hadn't cooked the books. He hadn't stashed away funds in his own bank account. And the company were pleased with his work. And having accepted his accounts, then he was asked, right, pay another set of accounts for the income tax authorities so that we won't have to pay the amount that the accounts that you prepared for us indicate that we should pay. But as a man of integrity, he said, no, the accounts I have produced are correct. They go for you, they go also to the income tax authorities. He lost his job. Being a man of integrity costs. But the truth is impartial, and we've got to go with it. The last concept that we find in these verses is that People of integrity have obligations. Just as that accountant had an obligation to his employers and to God, so we have obligations on the one hand to society, on the other to our Saviour. And this comes out in verses 14 to 17 in the passage that we've been reading together. Jesus said when he saw the coin, Whose inscription is it? Whose image is it? They replied, Caesar's. And so he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And so we find that in our position we have an obligation to the society in which we're placed, giving to Caesar. If you look at Romans chapter 13, Paul emphasizes these facts very strongly indeed. He says there, that we are to live in society as God's people. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which, is, which God has established. And he says that they are to pay taxes to whom taxes are due. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For as a man loves his brother, he fulfills the law. Obligations. Obligations to respect authority. Local government, national government. Obligations to obey the law. Obligations to relationships within society. That's where the second commandment comes to the fore. To love one's neighbour as oneself. That's integrity based on truth and impartiality, giving to Caesar what is Caesar's. But then the obligations to God. That's where the first commandment comes in. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. These are the words of Jesus. Obligations to God. The Shorter Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? And the answer comes, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's your calling and mine. To be upright, a person of integrity, giving to God's, God what is his. And Paul puts it in these terms, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. It's no accident that here in Mark 12, we find that greatest commandment and the second commandment. It's no accident either that the chapter ends with a reference to that widow putting into the treasury her two little mites, the tiniest coins that the Jews possessed. But she gave everything, didn't hold anything back. And that is what the Lord is requiring of people with, of integrity to give all that they should give to Caesar, but to give all that they should give to God, without reserve, hand it over. As I have to ask myself, what am I giving to God? My money? My time? Myself? 
Is it given to him completely and without reserve? In the local church or fellowship? While I'm at work? Does he want me overseas? Where does God require that as a person of integrity I am to go? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul wrote, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And so we have these three concepts. Disciples found it, a, in many ways, a very hard lesson to learn. Integrity, though it's in short supply, is demanded of them 100%. And they discovered that as they looked into the life of Jesus, they recognized integrity for what it really was. And having learned from him, they were able to go out into the world as men who were upright, committed to Jesus Christ, who spoke the truth in love. Let's ask for God's help in that. Almighty Father, we know that we live in a society which is largely corrupt, where integrity is no longer practiced by so many. We do thank you for showing us in the life of the Lord Jesus what real uprightness, what real integrity is. And in your strength, we want to make that our own. Help us not to bow before the pressures of other people among whom we work, to conform to crookedness, Help us to be true and at the same time loving, kind and caring all the time giving that which is due to the society, the obligations that you have placed on us towards those among whom we live. But help us too to give to you everything that is due our money, our time, our lives to be used by you wherever you want. We ask this for your glory. Amen.